it at that. <laughs> Uh, I'm Amanda Littman. I am the co-founder and executive director of Run For Something. We recruit and support young, diverse progressives running for local office across the country, 32,000 and counting. You are Stephanie Shriak, the president of EMILY's List. Um, <laughs> I want to start today with contesting the premise of this little convening. Um, it says behind us, the way to win. Stephanie, do we know the way to win? <laughs> do we know who can win? Do we know anything at all? That's Let's just put it right out there. Um, I want to start uh, first by saying thank you for, for having us. And uh, I want a huge shout out to this fabulous woman sitting next to me who, in a time of great crisis in, this, in the progressive side, in the Democratic Party side, uh, said we had to do something. And she, uh, with really like a handful of others, uh, started Run for Something and has inspired so many young people, women and men, lots of women, uh, to step up and run. And it is extraordinary what you have done. Thank so you. I just wanted to say thank you and great partner for Emily's List. Because um, they have, what is your number now? 30. So about 32,400. There we go. Oh, I love that. She's got. Ish? She's, you know, uh, Emily's List, uh, in partnership, we have over 46,000 women who want to run for office. So let's start with the opportunity of 2020 and how we win is this. It is this great explosion of passion for community, for service that has come in so many different ways. And we, we are, I feel like we are almost blessed to be in the places where we are right now, where for us at Emily's List, it is women who, I mean, let's just face it, they were pissed off after 16. Some of them still are. And they said, we have to do something. And these, these are folks who had never pondered running for office, ever. They were going on with their lives, figuring out how to take care of their families, and realized that if not them, if it not her, the one individual who was going to represent their community, their family, and stop what was going to happen. And that's, that's what we've been part of. And so as we go into moving forward, this momentum that we saw in 17 and 18, I am here to tell you it is not slowing down. And we need, because I know a lot of Democrats, and many of you know me, I have worked in Democratic politics for a long time. We're really good at hanging our head down and worrying that everything's going to fall apart. And I'm not saying that we should be naive about this, but we have opportunity. And if we want to sit around and wring our hands like we are going to fail, then what voter, voter wants to be part of that? I don't want to be part of that. I want to be part of the winning team who thinks they're going to win. And so part of what we need to do and how we win is we keep that momentum, that energy that is already on the ground. It is happening on the ground. And you saw Jim start off this, um, this evening talking about the bubble we live in. And so I am with, with Jim asking everybody to step out of your bu bubble and go anywhere else. Really, if you live in Washington, D.C., you literally can go 30 miles in any direction <laughs> and go chat with folks because what we're seeing is real energy on the ground. And when you see polls like 54% consistently who have very serious concerns about Donald Trump. Yes, I'm going to say his name. I'm not afraid of Voldemort. 54%. I don't think that's changing. That doesn't mean a lot of things can't go wrong. But it means there's also a lot of opportunity for new voices, new faces, up and down the ticket. And that's what I'm looking at here. Um, you know, we have seen the same kind of momentum since Election Day of 2018. More than 12,000 people have signed up with us to one run for office. It is not just a 2017-2018 plan. Surprisingly, none of those 12,000 are running for president. <laughs> that um, is surprising, isn't actually. <laughs> Um, Just wait another month. Uh, I'm sure. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> which I think takes me to my next question. Uh, there are things happening in 2020 besides the presidential election. Uh, what are you most excited about that isn't the top of the ticket? Well, it's, it's 
these these folks who are stepping up to finding their way to service. And as I think about uh, 2020, just as we thought about in 2018, I think it is so important that we think of every election as an opportunity to field candidates, good, strong, democratic candidates who represent their community, who bring their whole story into this in every single office available to run for. Our theory should be recruit broadly, target strategically. Do not, do not cut your recruitment off because you're targeting first. Because we need Democrats running in the reddest of areas, and we ought to be honest with them. You probably won't win. The first time. The first time. The first time. But if we don't start having conversations with every single community in this country about our values and why we believe in justice and liberty and freedom and to be of our communities, because they're, they're everywhere. I mean, as Amanda says, all these folks are signing up. They're not just signing up on the coasts. They are in all 50 states. They are in every community. We've got to give the tools and the empowerment, particularly to, you know, for us, for Emily's List, for these women to step up and run for city council and school board and county commissioner and that legislative seat that no Democrat has run in for 40 years. We've got to give her the tools to run. And so as I look at 2020, I think, you know, sort of in my darkest moments, this race could be very, very, very close. And we should run it. We should run it and be strategic like it's a close race. But we should build a ballot like it's a landslide. Because it might be. And if we don't have Democrats in those far off seats, we're going to lose that opportunity. And so I encourage everybody in every community and every organization to think about your leaders, whether you are in California or Oklahoma or Florida or Alaska about who you're running and who you're lifting up because those are our future leaders and and of course as we all know you know 2020 this is the last set of elections before redistricting the folks who are sitting in those legislatures are going to decide the next decade of congressional and legislative districts in most states not all uh, so we really need to be more deeply focused at the legislative level. Now, I get this all goes together, uh, particularly in presidential years, which is even more reason to get candidates up and running at the local and state level. Um, in particular, women running for state legislature face some pretty specific barriers to entry. Um, you know, 2018 was a record number year, record year. Women are running at record numbers, especially for state ledge. The percentage increased from like 25 percent to 28. I believe here in South Carolina, it's at maybe 16 percent. It's in the bottom 10 across the country. When you're thinking about women running for state legislature, what are you all doing? And even more importantly, what should people in this room at their organizations yeah. think about doing to increase that women and candidates of color? Right, and uh, you know, the good news is that we're making inroads and the good news is that we did win a lot, a lot of seats. I mean, Emily's List was proud to have uh, quadrupled the size of our staff that solely worked on state and local races this last election cycle in 2018. Uh, we endorsed nearly 700 legislative and local races, which a lot of folks don't realize Emily's List does a lot of that work. Uh, well over 350 of those women won. As we look at 2020, uh, in a series of about 30 different states, uh, with really a big focus on 16. We're looking at 400 that we need to hold on. You gotta keep the ones that won, by the way. That also goes for the US House. Uh, but then we also have opportunities in another 200, 220 races, we believe. But, but for women and candidates of color who are breaking into, you know, in a lot of states, a very uh, established set of incumbents, uh, who have been there a long time, what that often means is that they are white male incumbents. Uh, and so it is, a, uh, it is a challenging journey because they just have different networks. 
And so a lot of what we're doing, and I know you're doing the same, uh, and what we're being very intentional about is finding you know, strong, community-focused women of color in districts around this country who can bring people together who know their districts, whatever district it may be, legislative or, or otherwise, uh, and to, as you heard the governor talk about, sharing her story is bringing their story in perspective. That tie together, that authenticity is so important. And that's how we won a lot, a lot of races, were that we had these women who were willing to share their entire story. And as soon as they did that, voters voters in districts who you wouldn't think necessarily would vote for, well, let's say, for example, in a congressional seat, Lauren Underwood in Illinois, in a district that we weren't even sure we should recruit in because it was such a Republican district, right? And, and, let, and then a, an African-American woman, could she pull that off in this district that has never had an African-American nor a woman? But then you met Lauren, and Lauren just... <laughs> I mean, she's contagious with her joy and her smile, and she's wickedly smart, and she knows so much about the people in her district, and, and she let the people of her district get to know her and her story. And her story is a healthcare story that we all have. And if one thing ties us together more than anything is our healthcare stories. And that's how, that's how she, she won that. But... For a long time, I think it was particularly hard for women who've, who have been told by society, you gotta be perfect and you gotta fit a certain mold and you gotta look a certain way and you've gotta do that. And for a lot of women who broke through those glass ceilings that, and those doors that you and I have been able to walk through because of them, um, they had to do the hard breaking, but the doors are open now for some and we gotta do more breaking down doors. So now we can be, our, be ourselves. And I think that's the one thing we'd advise all of our candidates now is bring yourself into this. Bring your own auth authenticity and your story. That's the powerful part of this. You know, Run for Something's mantra is to um, invest in people, not geography. That a really good candidate can make a long shot race competitive. Um, and a really good candidate looks a lot of different ways. Um, so we talk about how voters should not be thinking about electability when they're looking at candidates. I think we as operatives often forget that component as well. Um, when you're looking at candidate recruitment or how you're engaging with candidates, especially in these more local races, how do you approach what does a good candidate look like? Yeah, and this is, you know, this is always a hard thing because it's, um, because part of what we're doing, right, is we're sort of ultimately having to lay down bets. I hate to say that on folks. Um, because we only have so many resources, and resources are, are, are limited to us, which is why I'm always like, sometimes we've got to take a little more time. Give it a little bit more time. Give it a, let's see what happens here. Let's see if she can find her voice, put together the organization. It's not just about the story, but you do have to do the work. Campaigns actually are businesses. You've got to put the pieces together. We cannot overlook that. Uh, we can help and we can teach, which we do a lot of, both organizations do a lot of training and teaching and do some together, uh, whereas, you know, you got to hire some staff probably. You got to do the fundraising. Are you willing to do the fundraising? You know, if it's smaller races, you got to do the doors. Sen you know, Senator Coons talked about how hard it is to do the doors, and it is, but you got to do it. <laughs> you got to do it. Uh, so we sort of look through that, but it's also that, that story um, and if they're willing to open up and, and share it. And sometimes you gotta give it a little bit of time. Electability is a very funny thing. And I gotta say, uh, particularly those of us who are in the operative and, and media world, we're not so good at choosing who the most electable candidate is. Because the world keeps changing and evolving and so do the candidates. And candidates get better. The, the best candidates, didn't always start as the best candidate. And they evolve and grow, and as I think about the presidential campaign, it's always the candidate that grows the most in the process that becomes the nominee, in my mind. Because you have to, you know, you have to really find sort of your footing. I think President Obama has even talked about this. 
and that it took him, he literally says it took him a year to figure out how to run for president while he was running for president. I think that's part of it. And I think that is for all of our candidates is, you know, we're all, a lot, we all are part of, or a lot of us run organizations or in states or working with, with candidates all the time is to give them the coaching and the support, the moral support to help them find their voice and to help them build the organization. But sometimes you just need a little time. Yeah, people who are born good candidates are weird. Um, <laughs> you, it takes a skill. You should have to put time and practice into it. That's what we tell our candidates every day. Um, I want to change gears a little bit and talk about primaries. Emily's List is one of the few organizations with an amount, any amount of resources that really engages in primaries in a meaningful way, um, in part because that's the way that women get through the door. Um, there is some backlash to that and to engaging in these primaries, um, in part through the committees. I know you have feelings. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, it's just sort of two questions there, and I, was, I will say the, um, the primary question, see, I, you know, both me and in my, in my other lives before Emily's List, because many of you know me from my years working in the Senate, uh, and also being on Emily's list is, I don't think primaries are something you should be afraid of. Uh, I, I know that the budgeting is daunting for those who have to spend money, and then you just gotta make your decisions. But, but primaries often are really good for the candidates because they get to practice. And particularly our first time candidates, we just elected a lot of first time candidates to the United States House of Representatives. Women who had never run for anything, anything at all, including like student council. Like they were coming in as teachers and nurses and a CIA agent, former CIA agent, <laughs> and veterans. And so they just, this wasn't, they weren't coming into it that way. And so going through the process a little bit, I always sort of came to the point that I'd rather have their first debate among Democrats than to have their first debate against a sitting incumbent Republican in the general election. I mean, you think about it that way, because uh, there is some learning and practice and, and with all of that. Uh, but if this were easy, uh, and if everything was still completely fair, or if it ever was completely fair, I should say, women are actually a slightly larger percentage of the population than men. So you would think that women and men would be equal in the numbers in government. So there are barriers and there are obstacles and, and some of it, a lot of it is cultural and some of it is just getting through our heads that we can do it. Uh, and then some of it is just the structures themselves and they're coming in from outside and outsiders are different and new. And so we, do, we gotta get into primaries and we gotta fight those primaries uh, and there's, you know, there are folks like Sheree, Congresswoman Sharice Davids and Congresswoman Lauren Underwood and Congresswoman Katie Porter and Congresswoman Katie Hill and Congresswoman Susan Wild, and the list goes on and on, who all needed help to get through their primaries. So we celebrate this extraordinary group of women in the United States House, and they are, they're amazing. I'm, I'm just so, I get emotional thinking about it. Uh, but a lot of them wouldn't have been there if they didn't have some support to back them up. Uh, and that's what we do. And that's, that's who we are. And our mission is to elect pro-choice Democratic women, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. Thank you, thank you. Um, now, the, the good news in the 35 years of, of Emily's list is that we went from an era when Ellen Malcolm founded, like, like you with her girlfriends, founded Emily's List. She used to bring candidates into the DCCC or the DSCC and they were like, yeah, whatever. Like literally, it just was, they just weren't all that open uh, because women didn't win in the 1980s and the 1990s, got a little better, a little better, a little better. We are now in an era where Emily's List actually works quite closely in recruitment uh, with the DCCC and the DSCC and the DGA. So I know Wendy's here as well uh, from the DGA. Uh, so they are good partners. Doesn't mean we agree all the time. And, and one of the things we worry about is when there are, when there are decisions like the DCCC's decision, I'll just put it out there because you've already read it in the paper if you've heard me talk about it, which is uh, the decision to block consultants 
who are involved in primaries against incumbents. And I disagree with that. Now, I'm a huge fan of the chairwoman, Chairwoman Bustos. I think she's fabulous. She'll always have my backing, but it doesn't mean I don't disagree with her on this decision because I think, I think those primaries are good for people, and if the incumbents can't hold their own, then there's something going on. And it allows consultants, new consultants, to get a start, particularly consultants, who, consulting firms that are led by women, which there are not enough of, and people of color, which there's truly not enough of. And so where else are we going to give those opportunities? And so I just think we got to be really careful about the decisions we make. And you know, I, I hope that will change someday. Like I said, we're still good partners, and we will do everything we can to hold that Democratic majority and add more women, and we'll stand right by her side in that process. Um, but you know, friends can disagree, and that's where we are on this one. We've talked about women candidates. You mentioned a little bit about women staff. Let's talk about women voters. Um, who do you think is the swing voter of 2020? This is a softball. <laughs> There's lots of women in the swing voters. Thank you so much. Um, so I, we were talking in the back because I've had this like growing anxiety uh, at Emily's List that comes with, one, all the stories about electability, which makes us want to pull our hair out because uh, the driving force of electability is basically built on the foundation of running the last campaign. And if we as Democrats focus on what happened in 2016 and fight that campaign again, we will lose this election. We cannot do that. So where the opportunity for 2020 comes up is that the electorate is going to look different. And we have to, we, I know it's hard, we've got, we got to be strategists, we got to think of this, we got to break ourselves out of the box, we've got to imagine what 2020 is and why it's not 16. Well, one reason it's not 16 is that we're not following eight years of Democratic presidents. Another reason it's not 16 is that Donald Trump is president and has a terrible record for women and families in this country. A person who has tried and succeeded in hurting our healthcare system, who has, who has completely ruined our standing in the world, who has separated children at the border, and the list goes on and on, a record he did not have. Now, we talked about it, but now he's actually done it. And we also are in an environment where, and you've seen in the polls that 54%, pretty on average, of Americans, of American voters, are very concerned about Donald Trump. That is not a good place to start if you're an incumbent. So we got to think about what is forward. And where, where I look at is there was a lot of momentum in 18. How do we keep that momentum? Now, one of the things that happened in 18 that I'm really hopeful about is that we had very, as you know, historic midterm turnout driven a lot by women voters, particularly women of color, but women voters in general. And what we saw in our battleground districts in a midterm were, was an electorate that was 54% women. 54% women. Now in a midterm, that's usually not the case because women drop off a lot. Women drop, voters drop off in midterms. Now in a presidential election, you'll often see a turnout of, a, of an electorate that includes 53, 54% women. But if this 2018 and the organizations here in this room work together, I believe that it is possible to turn an electorate that looks more like a 55, maybe 56% women. And then you tell me what Pennsylvania looks like if it's 56% women in that electorate, or Michigan, or Wisconsin. And then let's talk about how we move forward winning. And we've got to mobilize, we've got to turn out the base, we've got to give resources to that, and, and, and we have to persuade those women voters, there's a lot of white women voters, college-educated white women, and also are working class white women. And for those of us who hear, you know, 
it's all about the blue collar folks. I want you to start thinking about it in this definition. It is not necessarily the guy with the hard hat coming out of the mine, but it's the gal at the diner serving his coffee that we can get. And we got to go after them because they too, like all of us, want good health care and a job and dignity. These are proud, proud women, but they're open to us. And that's what we got to go after. Thank you. I'm fired up. All right. We're going to win this thing. Thank you, everybody.